It's October 27, 1962, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. So it was on this day that a Soviet naval officer called Vasily Arkhipov became what the Future of Life Institute described as arguably the most important person in modern history. And it was because of something he did not do. And what he did not do was permit his submarine to fire a nuclear torpedo at a US warship that almost certainly would have started World War Three. It is the most astonishing story, and it sort of feels like something that should be taught to every single person about why nuclear armaments are a bad idea. But basically, the story unfolded midway through the Cuban Missile Crisis, when this group of 11 United States Navy destroyers and their aircraft carrier that was with them found beneath the waves this submarine that was carrying nukes and started to send down depth charges to try the equivalent of smoking them out, get it to surface. Because they, the Americans, didn't know that the Russians had nukes on board. Otherwise, they might have been a bit more careful. Yes. And in fact, some of the Russian crew on board this particular submarine didn't know they had nukes on board. There were four Soviet submarines sent towards Cuba from the Arctic Circle as this crisis was developing. Each carried a so-called special weapon. But within the crew, a few people of authority realised that that referred to a nuclear-tipped torpedo with the force of an atom bomb. I mean, this wasn't a small Mm. nuclear weapon, (laughs) if such a thing exists. And the instructions that the Russian crew had been given was only to let off this torpedo if... Russia itself had been attacked by the Americans, or if they felt that an attack was absolutely imminent. Which, as Arian was saying, Mm. it wasn't. Like, what the Americans were doing at this point was just trying to say to the Russians, we Mm -hmm. know you're there, but the crews didn't realise that's what the signal meant. And because they had gone even lower into the water to avoid these depth charges, they were totally cut off from communications. They couldn't get any closer to the surface because the Americans obviously then would be that much closer to them. So they had to decide it would make a great, um, you know, one hour, one off (laughs) drama, wouldn't it? You know, just in a locked room. They had to decide what they were going to do in response because there was no way for them to know whether they were being attacked or not. There was an intelligence officer aboard called Vadim Orlov and he recalled that it felt like you were sitting in a metal barrel which somebody is constantly blasting with a sledgehammer. We thought, that's it, the end. And so the three senior officers on board met to discuss what was happening. And the other thing that you've got to know about this as well is that there was faulty air conditioning on board. So the the air was running out. So it was very hot, very stuffy, and they really did not have much time to make this decision. Yeah, to give you an idea of what one of these unbearably hot, old, diesel-powered submarines that the Soviets were using felt like when the aircon was cut off, Anatoly Andreev, who was a crew member on one of these different submarines nearby, he kept a journal and he described what it felt like. My head is bursting from the stuffy air. Today, three sailors fainted from overheating again. The regeneration of air works poorly. The carbon dioxide content is rising and the electric power reserves are dropping. Those who are free from their shifts are sitting immobile, staring at one spot. Temperature in the sections is above 50. Mm. And that's Celsius. So, I mean, that gives you a sense of what the conditions were like whilst they had to make this Mm. life and death decision for the world. And so the captain of the submarine, a chap called Valentin Savitsky, believed that war had indeed broken out, that they were being attacked. And the political officer, which you can it's easy to imagine that on a Soviet ship, that would be a very senior position, a guy called Ivan Maslenikov, he agreed. And on any of the other three ships in that flotilla, that would have been enough and the nuclear torpedo would have been launched. However... Arkhipov was the commodore of that flotilla. Because he had just happened to be on this submarine, he also needed consent before it could be launched. And he was the only one who held out. And apparently Captain Savitsky said, we're going to blast them now. We will die, but we will sink them all. We will not disgrace our navy. So this was kind of the attitude that Arkhipov was met with. And he had to stand firm that he did not think that they should fire their nuclear torpedo. I mean, it still feels like a leap to get from we are coming under fire to... Trigger the end of the world. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, the, that's really the astonishing thing, that the captain was ready to make that call to say, now is the moment that we launch our nuclear weapon. You'd think that their protocols would be more, more stringent than that. I mean, the hope may have been that because this was a so-called tactical nuke, you know, it's a, a nuclear weapon that's 
designed to be used in a conflict situation and to take out a very small and, and particular target rather than, say, an entire city. Maybe the calculation was we may be able to get away with launching a couple of these without dooming the whole world. And Arkhipov had good reason to be wary of nuclear warfare. The year before, he'd been serving on a different nuclear submarine, K-19. He was the second in command, and it suffered a reactor leak, and it narrowly avoided total nuclear meltdown. The way that they avoided it was that the engineering crew had to kind of jerry-rig a solution to the problem, and it ended with all the members of the crew being exposed to radiation, and the engineering crew all died within a month. So he had had personal experience with how devastating nuclear warfare could be. And in fact, his experience on that submarine, it was called the K-19, was part of what gave him quite a lot of the gravitas that he brought to the conversation about whether this was the moment to launch the the torpedo or Mm. not. Yeah, that's how he became leader of the flotilla, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Yeah. But also even on board, people were like, well, you've been through something very serious involving, in fact, a nuclear meltdown on a nuclear submarine. This was a nuclear armed sub that wasn't a nuclear sub, a weird sort of distinction. But um, but nevertheless, you've been in a, a situation involving nuclear power, and it's important to the case that we're dealing with now. But because this was a Cold War event at the peak of the Cuban Missile Crisis... It's not like afterwards, when crisis was averted, the Soviets then told everyone, oh, by the way, we nearly detonated a nuclear bomb. (laughs) Decades went by until we knew about this guy and about this scenario. So we don't know, because he was dead by that point, what he actually said to the commander to get him not to fire the nuke. There are all kinds of suppositions, like he must have said something like, oh, the Americans don't know we have a nuke. Um, they're dropping depth charges left and right so that is a signal they're saying come up and identify yourself we shouldn't do it you can imagine that strategically he might say that but you could also imagine because we don't know that he said something psychological because really Savitsky's order that the torpedo be fired was about his own humiliation wasn't it if you think about what Rebecca was saying Mm. yeah we don't want to be shamed I mean what a reason to end the world we don't want to be shamed. We want to be the boat that went down without doing anything, i.e. killing everybody. And, and I imagine that to talk to a man like that, and Arkhipov would have known exactly how to do it, he said something that was to do mm. with, you know, the mentality of the man, not to do with the strategy. Yes. And yet it was Savitsky who was psychologically more in sync with the top brass of the Soviet military, because when the sub returned to Russia, basically what happened is that they eventually agreed to surface, they could receive communications from Moscow. And the US ships actually, in the end, they did, of course, they didn't know they had nuclear weapons, but they allowed them to return peacefully. But they were received very coldly by their superiors in Moscow, who were furious that they'd been detected. It seemed like the reception was like, well, thanks for avoiding nuclear apocalypse. But it also, the important thing is that you were spotted. Kind of embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. And one admiral even said that they should have let themselves go down rather than be exposed. So they were very much in that mindset that Captain Savitsky was in, that it would have been better to, if they had just sunk and died rather than reveal themselves to the Americans. Yeah, but sink and die is very different to launch your <laughs> nuclear weapon and destroy everyone, <laughs> you know? <laughs> It wasn't until the 90s that this story emerged. And I think it wasn't until the 2000s that the fact emerged that there had actually been a nuclear weapon on board. And historians have referred to this incident as being the most dangerous moment at the most dangerous moment of the Cold War. So this probably is the closest we ever came to having a World War Three between the US and the Soviet Union. I mean, there was that time that Donald Trump thought about deploying nukes to try to break up hurricanes. <laughs> <laughs> That was also problematic. It's better not to know, isn't it, how close we've come. That's the truth. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, these warnings from history, they do they do make me think, oh, humans are fallible and nukes are a bad idea. But I knew that anyway. I'd rather right. not have this constant anxiety of finding out just how close we all came to complete extinction all the time. Like, apparently on one occasion, Jimmy Carter left nuclear launch codes in his suit when it was sent to the dry cleaners. And if we only just found out about this story, imagine all the other stories that are out there that we still haven't found out about. Yeah. Tomorrow. She was also accused of serving them a hasty pudding laced with goat dung. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.